Didn't the worship team do a great job this morning? They always do a great job. I hear something on the radio, and so uh, I'll send that to them, and I'll say, hey, let's do this Sunday. And uh, we come in, and we practice, and they get it together in about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So they do a fantastic job. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn over to 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, you'll need your swords or your phones or your tablets or wherever you've got your Bible. Uh, you'll need that this morning because we're going to look at a lot of different verses. You know, it's election day. It's time uh, for us to go and vote. <clears throat> you know, a while ago we sang a song, uh, Let Your Light Shine. And the best way to allow your light to shine as believers uh, on Tuesday is to vote. Now, I've already voted because I don't like to stand in line. How many of y'all have already voted? If you have, raise your hands. Yeah, you, don't got, you guys don't like to uh, stand in line either. But if you haven't voted, <clears throat> go ahead and vote on Tuesday uh, because that's the best way that you can let your light shine. Now, <clears throat> we're a religious organization, tax-free organization, and as such, I'm not allowed to tell you who to vote for. And, of course, I wouldn't try to do that anyhow. You vote for who you want to vote for. But I am allowed to tell you the criteria that I use to determine who I vote for. Uh, I've decided that uh, I'm old enough now that for the rest of my life, I'm no longer going to be politically correct. I'm going to be biblically correct. That's a new phrase. We're no longer we're going to be PC. We're going to be BC. Everybody wants to be BC instead of PC. Say amen. So in other words, who I have voted for and who I intend to vote for in the future, they're going to have to be biblically correct. And basically, in the way things are going on in America today, the way things are going, I basically have two categories that determine uh, how I vote. Uh, you probably already know what they are. You've listened to me for ten and a half years preach. You probably already know what these topics are. But these two topics represent the greatest threat to the United States of America, a lot more threat than ISIS, a lot more threat than Russia, because what happened is, if these two continue, what's going to happen is we're going to end up the, as a country on the wrong side of God. We don't want to be on the wrong side of God. Amen? When, in other words, any time that we sing God bless America, we want God on our side. If you want God on our side, say amen. We cannot have God on our side if uh, we're not in obedience to his word. It just can't happen. I believe that God has blessed our nation. I believe that God has prospered our nation. I believe God that has kept our nation safe through all of these 300 about years that we've actually existed from the time of the colonies up to the time today uh, that we have a nation. I believe God has protected us, defended us, taken good care of us because for the most part, for years and years and years, we represented the, the best ability of Jesus Christ around the world. For us, it was the nation of England, and they kind of quit doing it, and then the United States picked up the standard about 100 years ago, and we've taken more missionaries around the world than any other nation. So God has protected us in spite of ourselves. But I believe we've gotten to the point that it's going to be very difficult for God to protect us any longer if we remain in the situation we are. So let me tell you the two criteria that I use in every election and have so for about the last 20 years to determine who I vote for. The number one criteria I look at is what is a candidate stand on abortion? Abortion is murder. That's my premise. Abortion is murder murder. Look here in 2 Kings chapter 3 verse 26 and 27. I want to show you something kind of fascinating. <clears throat> Judah was uh, battling basically <clears throat> Israel was battling basing with uh, some of their uh, adversaries from Moab, the country of Moab <clears throat> and when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too severe for him he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even into the king of Edom but they could not. Then he took his eldest son, who should have reigned in his stead, and he offered him as a burnt offering uh, upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. What does that mean? That means this king, in order to get the local demons, and uh, you got to understand, you may say, well, Brother Don, you're just superstitious, you don't know anything. Well, I'm going to tell you what, around the world in regions, there are regional demons. There are good angels in, in Atlanta. There's good angels in this place today. There's good angels in our area. But there's also regional demons, reg regional evil spirits. And there were in the Middle East at that time. And so what happened is, is that when, they, when this king offered a child sacrifice, uh, what it did, it allowed that local demon to be empowered. So I want you to think about this. 
child sacrifice energizes demonic forces child sacrifice energizes demonic forces there's no question that the idea behind abortion is, a, is an evil idea that was behind it from the very now they use a lot of things to dress it up today we're going to deal with those in a minute but there's no question there was an evil idea behind it but why why is that such a big deal to kill babies what's the big deal it energizes evil forces so every time we kill a million and a half babies in the womb every year, which is what we do in the United States of America, we're energizing evil forces within our nation. Now that is not, you know, that is not a good thing. Does anybody think that's a good thing? That is not a good thing. Somebody have never thought of it that way, but that is not a good thing. Let's go on. Turn, if you would, over to Jeremiah uh, chapter 19. Jeremiah chapter 19. I told you we're going to be looking at a lot of places today. In Jeremiah chapter 19, Here's what Israel was doing, and actually Judah was doing. <clears throat> you remember Israel was the ten tribes in the north, Judah were the two tribes in the south. What they were doing, and I want to read God's response to this, what they were doing under King Manasseh is that the Israelites had kind of, and the Judeans had kind of sold out to this idea that if they wanted these regional gods on their side, they had to offer child sacrifice. Now I was in northern Africa uh, in the area that used to be Carthage uh, oh about five or six years ago maybe and uh, we went there to the town and we went to an area that had all these little bitty small tiny tombstones just thousands of them and I asked the guide I said what are all these little tiny tombstones he said I really hate to say and I said I said well just tell me what they are he says well we did some x-ray analysis underground and there are just thousands of infant carcasses underneath there and we know what they are. And I said, well, what are they? He said, well, the Phoenicians founded this area of the Mediterranean and the Phoenicians brought uh, a god named Malcolm that they worshipped, uh, Malcolm, and uh, they taught the people that lived in this part of Africa to offer child sacrifices to Malcolm. And what they would do is twice a year when it's time for, to plant and time to harvest, what they would do, they would heat this statue of Malcolm up white hot and they would take their children and throw them into the statue and the child would just burst into flames. And there's literally, they found this burying field of literally thousands of infants that had been offered in sacrifice to this, uh, God Malcolm. Well, fast forward over to the Middle East to the time of Manasseh when he was king over Judah. And what, Mal what, what Manasseh was doing, he was going down into the Valley of Hinnom. Now, we talked about that a little bit last week. There's three valleys that surround Jerusalem. If you're standing on the Temple Mount and you're looking at the Mount of Olives, that's the uh, Valley of Kidron. That's the Valley of Hinnom. And in the Valley of Hinnom, Manasseh was causing the people of Judah to sacrifice their infants to a god, Molech who was supposed to be a regional god that would give them a prosperous harvest and make their animals grow and make their animals fruitful, etc. And they were doing exactly the same thing there in the Valley of Hinnom that they had been doing previously. had taught the people to do over in northern Africa. They were, they were sacrificing infants in order to strengthen these local demons so that they could get what they wanted to out of these demons. Now, I know that sounds terrible to you, and it is terrible, and it was so terrible that listen to what God said here in Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 6. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that this place shall no, no longer be called Topheth, <clears throat> nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but it shall be called the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hands of those who seek their lives and their carcasses will I give to the food for the fowls of the, of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city desolate and a hissing place. Everyone that passes by it shall be appalled and hiss because of all its plagues. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. This was in a, a siege. And they shall eat everyone the flesh of his friend in the siege and distress with which their enemies and they that seek their lives shall distress them. This shall break the flask on the side of the men that go before them. And the reason that God was doing that because they have been offering the sacrifice of what God called the innocents. Now this was in the valley of Hinnom. Everybody say Hinnom. In the New Testament, <clears throat> I this, but the word hell is used 13 times 
uh, every time by Jesus. But the word that he uses for the word hell is Gehenna. And Gehenna was a physical place in the valley of Hinnom, which is exactly where that statue of Mount Moloch was that Manasseh sacrificed all those babies to. So when Jesus wanted to describe to people what hell would be like, he used the phrase Gehenna because to Jesus nothing was more appalling or more horrible. Jesus wanted the people to understand how horrible hell is. And to Jesus, nothing was more appalling than that place within the valley of Hinnom where they had offered child sacrifices. Now that's what God thinks about <coughs> the shedding of innocent blood, and especially infants. That's what God thinks about. Uh, go over and look at uh, 2 Kings... Uh, uh, let's go, I tell you what, let's go to Jeremiah 1.5. We're in Jeremiah, so let's go to Jeremiah 1.5. Now, <coughs> there's the argument out there today that, and I guess the biggest argument, you know, if, you, if you're doing an evil thing, you have to come up with some sort of, as a nation, if you, the nation has agreed that abortion is okay. Um, they've done that through the courts, and every time that Congress, our representatives, have tried to do anything uh, to turn the time, courts have interceded and said, no, abortion is legal. That's why it's so important that who you vote for, that you make sure you to put Supreme Court justices that are going to be against abortion. Otherwise, this is just going to continue forever. But I guess the <clears throat> main argument in favor of abortion, um, I suppose, uh, as opposed to, and, and kind of opposition to the evil of killing a child, the main argument is, is that <clears throat> the woman has the right over her own body, and the woman has a right to determine what happens in her own body and besides that nobody wants an unwanted pregnancy in the world have you ever heard those arguments nobody wants an unwanted pregnancy uh, the woman has a right over her own body so let's take them one at a time here Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 here, listen to what God said about Jeremiah before I formed you in the womb I knew you and before you came forth from the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. So before Jeremiah was even conceived, God knew Jeremiah. God had a plan for Jeremiah. And when Jeremiah's parents conceived, God placed Jeremiah in the womb in that conceived body. And so literally in the womb, Jeremiah became a living soul, even though he wasn't born yet, he was a living soul because in the womb God selected these parents for Jeremiah and selected what Jeremiah's future was. Therefore, it's important to understand that every person that lives on this planet, whether in the womb or out of the womb, has been conceived by their parents but have been what? Given their soul and their spirit by God. And God has a plan for every single human being on the planet. So therefore, if God's got a plan for the unborn infant in the mother's womb, how in the world does that give the mom the right to decide the future of that infant? And the answer is, she doesn't have that right. And then the second argument is, and this one's kind of near and dear to my heart, nobody wants an unwanted pregnancy. Maybe in the case of a rape, maybe in the case of, you know, uh, two teenagers out doing what they shouldn't do and somebody gets pregnant. Those things happen all the time. Has that ever happened to one of your kids? Happened to one of mine. You know what? We're blessed by the baby that was born from that, amen? Here's the deal. It's okay to abort unwanted pregnancies. I wouldn't be here today. In 1950, I was an unwanted pregnancy. In 1950, if they'd had abortion, I'd be history. Now, I don't know that all the details behind who my mother was. I don't know any of the details, really. I don't know any of the details around who my biological father was. I like to think that they're really, like, really rich people, and that when they die, secretly in the on the door and they, I think I was going to bring a $10 million check to the door. I, you know, I, like to, I like to think about that, but I haven't really lost any sleep over it because at the time that they got 
they determined that uh, they didn't want me. Well, that didn't break my heart at all because I have, I've had a fantastic life. Amen? I had fantastic adopted parents that I think is my real parents. I don't think of the biological parents as my real parents. But what if we had fast forwarded, instead of me being conceived in 1950, what if I'd been conceived in 1980? What might have happened to me? And what if I'm in a place kind of like, see, in Kentucky, where I'm from, in Kentucky, there's only two abortion clinics in the whole state. One's in Lexington and one's in Louisville. By the way, I was born in Lexington, and the abortion clinic in Lexington is two blocks from where I was born at the old St. Joseph Hospital. But down here in Atlanta, you guys have 24 abortion clinics in the city, metropolitan city of Atlanta. So what would have happened if my parents, biological parents, had conceived me in 1980, 1990, today, what would have happened to old Don? I bet maybe they would have done the right thing and put me up for adoption. Maybe. Some parents do that. Maybe they would have kept me. Today, more parents are doing that than used to because of the stigma behind having a child out of wedlock. Maybe. Or maybe I would have ended up in a garbage dump somewhere in a plastic sack. The odds were any of those three things could happen today. Now that's not right. That's not right. What if, some, what if your parents had decided to abort you? Was that what to do? Would not be there yet. You're shaking your head. No, you're there. I understand. That's good. You said, no, mom doesn't have that right. No, no, I agree. So in other words, this is a huge issue. This is not a political issue. This is a moral issue. This is a, this is not a politically correct issue. It's a biblically correct issue. Everywhere in the Bible that there's a group of people that are participating in infant sacrifice to God, it's called an abomination. <clears throat> now, over in Leviticus 20, uh, 1 through 5, if you would turn over to Leviticus 20, uh, 20, 1 through 5, and we just want to look at one verse, really. Uh, over in Leviticus, uh, it's an interesting uh, 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 verse here that I found. I went this uh, fall, Debbie and I were in in Austria, and uh, look at this verse here in Leviticus 20, uh, verse 4 and 5. And if the people of the land do in any way hide their eyes from the man who gives his seed unto Molech and kills him not, then I will set my face against uh, that man and against his family and will cut him off <clears throat> and all that play the harlot with him to, make, to commit harlotry with Molech among uh, their people. So in other words, what God's saying there is that if you see somebody uh, doing this deed and you don't deal with the situation, then God also will hold you responsible. The, we were at Dachau, which that's not the same as Auschwitz by any stretch of the imagination. Several million people were uh, exterminated in Auschwitz. And in Dachau, the average, the average that we saw from different figures is around 50,000 people <coughs> died in Dachau was the first concentration camp in Germany because it's right outside of Munich and that's where kind of hit, uh, Hitler's headquarters were in that area. What's interesting is the town of Dachau is actually a town and it kind of, the, the concentration camp, which was a huge place, was right in the middle of that town. And all the trains that brought all of these prisoners into the concentration camp went right through the center of town. We went right over the railroad tracks. Right downtown, we went and ate at shops that were shopped in shops and ate in a couple of restaurants that were there during the time of World War II. And so the people of Dachau, after the American forces came in and found what was inside the prison, they said, oh, about this. We didn't know that this stuff happened. We're not responsible. We didn't know. The Lutheran church, we didn't know. The Catholic church, we didn't know. They knew. And the reason they had to know is that the Germans got so far behind burying bodies that they were stacking up 10,000, they found 10,000 corpses stacked up in the Dachau concentration camp. You think they knew? You betcha. That's right in the center of town. You think they smelled that? Of course they did. You think they knew what that was? I think they knew. When the trains pulled in with the screaming people, save us, save us, save us, you think they knew? I bet they knew. 
What did they do about it? Hid their head in the sand, did nothing. We know that there's a million and a half babies being aborted every year. What are we going to do about that? You see, now all of a sudden, it's become politically incorrect to say anything about it because it might hurt somebody's feelings. And I understand that. I used to preach on abortion all the time and I found out that what I discovered was is there were some people there that had had abortions. And so after I found out who they were, I talked to them and asked them if they uh, wanted me to give them a heads up if I was going to mention abortion that Sunday. And they said, no, 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 we want to be there. Uh, can I, and I said, can I share you? No, we can't share our testimony. I said, can I put you in contact with other people in our congregation that's had abortions? Yes, please. There was four in our little congregation that had an abortion. They got together and they began to heal. Because here's the deal, from the mom's perspective, when a, if a woman has a miscarriage, nature takes, kind of takes care of things. There's still going to be depression, there's still going to be that pregnancy didn't go to term, you know. We had, Debbie and I, uh, she had one miscarriage in between our second son and our third son. And there's a little bit of depression there and some things that occur. But in abortion, that is not a natural thing. And what happens is, is the, the mechanism that gives women the ability to have children just keeps pumping along, and that, there's no longer a fetus there. And consequently, sometimes women, it takes them <clears throat> maybe their entire lives to forgive themselves for what's happened. I'm just telling you the truth. So this is my primary criteria for determining who I vote for. I don't care... Uh, I don't care what party they're part of. I don't care if they're good looking or bad looking. I don't care what the news media says about them. If they're against abortion and the other candidate's not, then I'm going to vote for the candidate that's against abortion. Amen? And across the board, not just for the presidential candidates, one candidate is for abortion, one's against abortion. I voted for one against abortion. Uh, down the slate of candidates, I looked in each category, and that's what I used next category. I got one more criteria that I use. Let's talk about this one a little bit. And that's what's happening to our families. <clears throat> In the Bible, killing infants was called an abomination. Okay? That's what God called it. I didn't call it that. God called it that. But he also calls people that gossip an abomination. So you got to be careful here. Don't throw any stones this morning, okay? But the other thing that he calls an abomination, he calls adultery an abomination. Okay, so don't throw any stones if you're committing adultery. But one of the things that's consistently an abomination and the reason that God took all of the people... Haven't you ever wondered why God took Israel and gave them the promised land and, told them, and, and he told them to go in and get all the people out of his land? It's primarily because of the sin of homosexuality. That's what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. To God, that is an abomination. Now, here's the way I think the Bible looks at it. If an individual, here's the deal, homosexuality is like just a different form of lust. There's a lot of different kind of lust out there, and that's a, that's a form of lust. If an individual engaged in homosexuality, then that individual has committed sin, and that in individual is personally responsible for that sin. Nothing we can do about that. But, and if, uh, if a person uh, decides to go out and have something, that's a sin. Nothing we can do about that. That's a personal decision. But when the United States government says it's okay for homosexuals to marry and then they require that the local judge executives give them marriage certificates, then that's a whole different ballgame. You may say, well, that's just not fair way God made them. I don't believe that. I don't believe God made an abomination. I think God made people because he loved people. I think he knew that we're all sinners. But I don't think God created any abominations out there. But when the United States government puts their sanction upon a sin, whether it be killing babies or it be homosexual marriage, then that makes them a partner in that sin. Now think about that. When the United States government puts their sanction on a sin, whether it be homosexuality, whether it be abortion, whether it be anything else that is a sin, and they say, okay, no matter what God says, this is okay in our country, 
then our government has become a participant in the sin itself. And since the government itself won't stand before God in the judgment, then if God judges that country for that sin, the judgment has to come in this lifetime. Now think about that. And it's not just the United States. Any country sanctions an abomination to God becomes a participant in the sin. You know what? And what the Bible says very clearly is that we, as we come towards the last day, there'll be a greater and greater and greater polarization of those who are in the light and those who are in the darkness. Around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world. Who would have ever thought that that polarization would be here in the United States? And what's going to happen is that polarization as that polarization begins to pull apart from each other, you've got the folks in the light, the folks in the darkness. What's going to happen is the folks in the darkness are going to begin to hate the folks in the light. Haven't you ever noticed that the only religion that anybody really picks on is Christianity? They don't pick on the Muslims because they're afraid they're going to get their heads chopped off. But they pick on Christianity all day long. I can preach a sermon like this and there'll be more said about it than, some, than, than what, ha, what ISIS does in the name of Islam. This is a, you're mean-spirited people. No, we're not. Let me ask you a question. Anybody here ever raise any kids? It is a painful experience. I raised four of them, and now it seems like I'm raising seven grandkids, and that's really a painful experience. <clears throat> because I'm a lot softer with my grandkids than I was with my kids. But if you see your kid engaging in dangerous activity, is it love to let him continue or is it love to try to get him to stop? Which one is the love? You tell me. If you see your kid wandering towards the street, is it love to let him go and experience new things? <clears throat> like a dump truck hauling gravel down South Friendship Road? Or is it love to say, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not old enough to be out there doing this yet. When you get ready, we'll, we'll learn how to go to the street and get the mail. We're, we're gonna, we'll learn that. You don't need to be doing that right now. You see, real love is, is when you see somebody messing up, you try to help them. It doesn't always work. When you see a friend messing up, you're not showing them any any friendship or any love, if you continue to let them mess, mess up, you need to say something to them. You know? I mean, that's what's supposed to happen. So if, where's the love? If the love and not say anything as we see a country self-destructing, the country is destructing. See, listen to me now. If you're listening, say amen. We do not have a skin problem in America. We've got a sin problem in America. And what's created all of this, goodness gracious, I've never seen anything like it in my whole life. What's created all of this is that we have lost our heart as a country. Our heart used to be pretty much focused on God when I was a kid, for the most part. But we've lost that. And consequently, we don't know what we believe anymore. And the new generation, the generation millennials, they sure don't know what they believe because their parents and their grandparents were all crazy hippie people. And what happened was they said, well, there's no absolute, so we want to teach our children how to make good decisions based on the circumstances in which they are. Brothers and sisters, that's called... There is nothing in the Bible that is relative. Relativism is another name. Today, the new name for relativism is political correctness. That's relativism. Biblical correctness are absolutes. There are things that are absolutely right and there are things that are absolutely wrong. Amen? Every, everything doesn't determine, is not determined by its circumstances. For example, when I first got here to Atlanta, one Sunday I used in, in my sermon, red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in his sight. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? Yeah, you heard it in Sunday school when you were a kid. Well, I had a lady come up after church and said, you can't say that. I said, what can I say? She said, you can't say red, yellow, black, and white. I said, why can't I say that? She said, it'll hurt somebody's feelings. 
I said, did you listen to everything that I said? I said, red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in his sight. See, the PCer picks up on the red, yellow, black, and white and says, boom, no way. They missed the part, they're all precious. The first part is PC, the last part. Gwinnett County where I live, okay? White males. So if it get upset at anybody, amen. See thing. It's meant to show that God loves everybody. And the idea that God loves one group of people more than anybody else is just what? what? What's the word for it? Baloney. God loves everybody. Hey, well, look around this room. None of us look the same. But you know what? He loves all of us, no matter how we look, no matter where we're from, no matter who we are. God loves us the same. One thing remains. What? God's love. When God says, abortion, an abomination. He's not saying that out of hatred for mankind. He's saying that out of love. Because he loves everybody. He loves the infant in the womb and he loves the infant. When he says homosexuality is an abomination, why is he saying that? Is he saying it because he hates homosexuals? No, he loves the homosexual. He just doesn't want them involved in the sin. But God's not afraid to judge when people don't listen to what he's got to say. Turn over if you would. One last thing and then we're going to be out of here. John chapter 3, 16. Everybody that can say John 3, 16 by memory, raise your hand and say amen. Yeah, everybody knows that one. Everybody that can say John 3, 20 by memory. Anybody know that one? Ah, you should have learned it in vacation Bible school, but that's okay. <clears throat> John chapter 3. And look at it, verse 14 serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what they're talking about is the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness were sinning. And because of that, God sent snakes among them, and start, they started biting them. Everybody that was a sinner, God, they, God had them biting the serpents. So Moses put up this bronze serpent on a pole, and everybody that looked at the serpent was saved from the snake bites. And so that's what this means. Just as Moses had to lift of the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And a lot of people stop right there. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Listen, if you were born into this world, say amen. That's not a trick question. Everybody that is born into this world will eventually become guilty of sin and therefore guilty of condemnation. Jesus doesn't have to condemn anybody. He didn't come to condemn anybody. This sermon today is not designed to condemn anybody. Jesus came so that we might be saved from the natural condemnation of all men. Amen? All men are condemned unless they get saved from the condemnation. And the only way they can get saved is through Jesus. That's why Jesus came. And listen, listen to the rest. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation <coughs> that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that... Proved or exposed. But he that does the truth that manifest that they are wrought in God. Jesus, the light of the world, Jesus, the truth of the world, Jesus, the way to God, he has ascended into heaven and he's coming back to get us one day. Amen. In the meantime, who is the light of the world? We are the church. We are. We're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. 
Don't go put your light under a basket. What does that mean? That means just as surely as Jesus love, everybody says, well, Jesus never inherited. No, but Jesus love. The woman caught in adultery. What did he say to her? Oh, that's okay. He didn't say that. He says, your sins are forgiven. He called it what it was, sin. He said, go and sin no more. That's what he said. Everybody else said, well, he it was okay. No, it wasn't okay. It was a sin. And he called it a sin. And he forgave her sin. He loved her. But he says, go and sin no more. Because that's the best thing for you. Because I love you. God tells us all these things, not because he hates us, not because he wants to be mean, but because he loves us. Now, here's the deal. Whether or not our vote... <clears throat> Biblically, whether or not our biblically correct vote can make any difference in the world, if, in the world as far as what God's going to do with America, I just. But here's the deal: I do know. I'm personally responsible before my God to be the light, and that means I got to vote as the light. Amen. You are personally responsible before your God be the light. So therefore you have to vote as the light not the darkness. It'd be great also if we spoke the light and we demonstrated the light. My job is to preach the truth. You know I don't like this very often because invariably somebody mad or whatever it takes mental. But what Jesus says about it, he says However you judge somebody else is the way you're going to be judged. In other words, don't judge somebody else until you're willing to be judged. So if I say, hey, abortion is murder, that is, that is a true statement, then it's for the benefit of that person that's thinking about abortion to reconsider. All they really got to do did you know that 90% of the women that want to have an abortion, if they'll go look at the ultrasound first, they won't have the abortion? Because when they look at the ultrasound, they know that's a human being there. It kind of blew me away. The first two kids, there's the last two kids that had an ultrasound. It just kind of blew me away what you, what you can see in the room. So where does that leave us today? We are the salt and the light of the world. And at this election, the best that we can do is to vote biblically correct. That's it. It's as simple as that. Vote biblically correct. These are my two criteria. They are absolutely, to, to me, they are absolutes. If somebody is for abortion, I'm not voting for them. If somebody, if somebody is uh, for the homosexual lifestyle and thinks that should be legalized, I'm not voting for them. That's my two absolutes. Maybe you could add some other biblical absolutes in there that I haven't thought about, and that'd be really cool too. But those two for sure are, I would recommend to you to search out the candidates and vote for the candidates that are against abortion and against homosexual marriage. I would do that. I'm not going to tell you who those people are. You can research that for yourself. I'm sure it'll be in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution if you want to read that thing, or I'm sure it's on about a million blogs out there if you want to read the blogs. Whatever you want to read, maybe even be on TV, who knows. But research it and vote for the people that line up biblically correct. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for your great love. Uh, Lord, you love us in spite of ourselves. We are just sinners, Lord. That's a fact. We commit sin. Even when we don't want to commit sin, Lord, we still commit sin. And so, Lord, today we pray for our nation. We pray for this election. We pray for your will to be done, whatever that is, Lord. And we're well aware, Lord, that you are the ones that give us uh, the leaders that we have in our country. But you give us the leaders that we deserve, Lord. So I pray that all of God's people will go out this week and vote biblically correct in alignment, picking candidates in alignment with your word. That's my prayer, Lord. Be with us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. And if things don't work out, Lord, help us to be Daniels in uh, this coming society. We love you, Lord Jesus.
and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's sing. Let's sing. Come on.